last few weeks, we have been looking at what makes someone a Christian? Uh, what is it that we believe and why? And you know, we're all searching. And in this world of ours, which not just seems, is so upside down sometimes, we struggle to find meaning and purpose in our lives. And, and we need to be reminded of our foundational beliefs and of whom we, in whom we put our trust. The Apostles' Creed reminds us of that. So we've been walking through the creed and looking at what it says and how it translates into our everyday lives. The creed does not deal with ideas. Instead, it tells us about the living God and of the wonder of God's love for us. It tells us the story of Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, and the implications of that on who we are. It confirms the power of the Holy Spirit coming to stand by our side and with us. It must be allowed to touch our hearts and impact our living as much as it informs our understanding. And so today we come to the last affirmation in the creed and it concludes with this powerful note of hope as it prepares us for that time when we will stand in the presence of God. We say, I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. So I invite you to follow along as I read from 1 Corinthians 15. And this is a, a chapter where the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth and he talks a lot about um, resurrection of the dead and those in the church particularly who are denying the resurrection of the dead. He says, we preach that Christ rose from the dead. He says, so why are some of you here saying that there will be no resurrection? And then he goes on to insist that what happened to Christ will also happen to us. Everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life like Christ was raised. And then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. So even with that, it still leaves a lot of, leaves a lot of unanswered questions for us. And we can begin to address some of those by looking more at chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. So again, follow along with me. But someone may ask, how will the dead be raised? What kind of bodies will they have? What a foolish question. When you put a seed into the ground, it doesn't grow into a plant unless it dies first. And what you put into the ground is not the plant that will grow, but only a bare seed of wheat or whatever you are planting. Then God gives it a new body God wants it to have. A different plant grows from each kind of seed. And then we go on with um, uh, verses 40, 20, uh, 42 through 44. It's the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. They are buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. And then we continue finally with the end of that chapter, beginning with verse 50. What I am saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. But let me tell you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies 
must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, God gives us victory over sin and death through Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of God for the people of God and God's people say, thanks be to God. So let me invite you now to bow your heads and pray for me in sharing this message with you. And I will pray for you that God will speak a word into your life and heart this morning. Let's pray. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So my very first day serving here was eight years ago this August. And a few weeks before coming, I had my first day all planned out. I knew the phone calls that I was going to make and the people that I was going to visit and, and, and wander around and say hello to the entire staff team. I had everything planned out. But sometime in early to mid-July, I received a phone call that Geraldine had passed away. Geraldine and Ron had been active in the church in Trinity when I was growing up here over on the 8th Avenue campus and they'd been youth counselors. They were like family to my family. Aunt Geraldine and Uncle Ronnie, we called them. Uh, and so when, when Ron called and asked if I would do the service as soon as I arrived, of course, I agreed. And as it worked out, the service was on my very first day. I remember uh, walking from the car in the parking lot over there um, and walking in this direction and running into someone who, who said, I I'm not sure exactly where the service is. Can you point me in that direction? And I said, well, I'm not sure either, but we will find it together. <laughs> and I I'm sure she thought it was a little odd when I stood up to welcome everyone and said that I was the pastor. But that's how it goes sometimes. That was only one of many times at Trinity when I have walked with someone through grief and tragedy after a death. You know, it's an interesting journey to walk with a loved one, someone who is mourning, to walk with them through death and dying because I can't fully explain resurrection or everlasting life. I, I don't fully understand it, but I believe it. I believe it. Scripture says that while in this life we may have a partial picture, we may get glimpses of God, after death we will experience God in a sure and present way that is not possible in this life. The God who has walked beside us in this life, whose presence we have sensed along the way, will be unmistakably and intimately present in the life to come. But what does that look like? The ancient Greek philosophers believed in the immortality of the soul. They believed that when a person dies, the soul, the soul escapes the soon-to-be-decaying body and floats off into the spiritual realm. You know, that's often still articulated today. Many faithful Christians would answer with a, a sweet sentimental notion of our souls going up to heaven and just looking down over us. I have alluded to that several times myself. But guess what? That has no basis in Scripture. It has no basis in the Bible. The Apostle Paul says that we will be raised with a body. 
just as Christ was raised with a body. You remember Christ appeared to Mary in the garden and she thought he was the gardener. He had a body and then he appeared to the disciples in the upper room. He had a body and then to Thomas he showed him the the scars in his hands and in his feet and and his side and then he appeared to the disciples who were walking on the road to Emmaus. The Hebrews believed that as God created human beings, God created them as whole and unified beings. Body, mind, and soul all tangled up together. There's no such thing as a disembodied soul. Now, hang in there with me. This is a little bit deep, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then God has abandoned the physical bodies that God created for us, that God has given us. Yet, creation and redemption are always held together by God. Creation and redemption are always held together by God. If there is no resurrection, <clears throat> then that creation is discarded. But the creator of heaven and earth does not reject creation, but redeems it. Resurrection of the body confirms God's love for all of creation. Still, we might say, how, how does this happen, though? How? How? It makes no sense to us. We just can't see how it works. Well, let me read you the scripture from the message, which is a paraphrase instead of a, an actual literal translation. So, so follow along with me. Some skeptic is sure to ask, show me how resurrection works. Give me a diagram. Draw me a picture. What does this resurrection body look like? If you look at the question closely, you realize how absurd it is. There are no diagrams for this kind of thing. We do have a parallel experience in gardening. You plant a dead seed. Soon there is a flourishing plant. There is no visual likeness between the seed and the plant. You could never guess what a tomato would look like by looking at a tomato seed. What we plant in the soil and what grows out of it don't look anything alike. Tomato seeds. Planted. And yet, they are nothing like the result. What comes up out of the ground. How many of you have ever planted bulbs? The same analogy holds there. Follow along with me again. This image, I think we've got another, the 40, 42 through 44. Is there another slide? There we go. This image of a dead seed and raising of a live plant is a mere sketch at best, but perhaps it will help in approaching the mystery of the resurrection body. But only if you keep in mind that when we are raised, we're raised for good, alive forever. The corpse that is planted is no beauty. When it's raised, it's glorious. Put into the ground weak, it comes up powerful. The seed is grown the seed sown is natural. The seed grown is supernatural. Same seed, same body, but what a difference from when it goes down into, the physical morta into physical mortality to when it is raised up in spiritual immortality. Seeds to tomatoes, bulbs to glorious gladiolas. We would never imagine the transformation, the beauty, the redemption. And yet that's how resurrection will be. Jesus, the one who knows you better than you know yourself, 
has gone ahead to prepare a dwelling place for you, a resurrection body for you. And that resurrection body will be the perfect fulfillment of who you are now becoming. In your resurrection, you will look more like you than you can picture. You will be more you than you can ever imagine. For any of you who have ever shopped for a wedding dress, it can kind of be like that. You don't know what you're looking for exactly, but you will know when you find it. A week from tomorrow, our daughter Shelby Hart and her husband Mike will have their sixth wedding anniversary. And I can vividly remember the wedding dress and shopping, shopping for wedding dresses with Shelby. I drove to Raleigh, we blocked out two full days to go wedding dress shopping and find the perfect dress. Now Shelby had in mind what she wanted. She wanted something that would be fitted and maybe a little flare at the bottom. She did not want a ball gown skirt. She didn't want a long train. That would just be too cumbersome. She wanted something that would be mostly or all lace. She didn't want satin. She didn't want a bodice that was pleated. She didn't want strapless, and I agreed. Too hard to find one that fits right and, and, and not comfortable. We looked and we looked. We went to three or four different shops and she tried on so many dresses, too many to count, and nothing seemed to be right. And when she was finally in a state of almost uh, exhaustion, even uh, exasperation, I suggested that she just try on something in a ball gown style. I said, let's just try a different style and, and, and see if you might like that shape better. And, and she agreed, anything, at this point, anything. So I went out and I looked for this ball gown shape in the, in the shop and there just weren't very many choices, but there was one. And so I drug it back and I said, just ignore everything else, ignore everything else and, and just look at the shape of, of the dress. And so she put it on and the attendant painstakingly buttoned all the buttons up the back and I just stood there and watched. And Shelby turned around and faced the mirror and when she did, she just got this sheepish look on her face. And then she started to get teary. And then she looked at me with this inquiring look. And we both knew it was the one. I said, that's you. That's just so you. And it was satin and it had a long train and it had a ball gown skirt, and it was strapless, and it had a pleated body, bodice, but it was just so Shelby. It was perfect. That's how it will be with our resurrection bodies. We will all be changed. And the one who has begun a good work in us will bring it to completion. These bodies which are subject to brokenness and disease and decay will be transformed. There will be no more mourning and no more crying. And pain will be no more. For all of the first things have passed away and we will be a new creation. There will be no more cancer and no more autism. No more depression or anxiety or mental illness. No cerebral palsy or ALS. No more addiction or mental illness. No more heart disease. No more Alzheimer's or dementia. Our bodies die in weakness, but they will be raised in power. They die in brokenness, but when they are raised, they will be glorious. Just imagine what we will see on that great and glorious day when we see our loved ones, when we see one another, and we say, that's you. That's just so you. 
Now there's one more word I want to talk about, and that's the very last word in the creed, and it's amen. We're going to say it together in a minute, and I hope that you will hear it with fresh ears and renewed commitment. But have you ever thought about the fact that it ends with amen? That one word reminds us that the creed is as much a prayer as it is a statement of faith. It's a prayer that the power and presence of God will touch our lives in a way that transforms us. It's a prayer that reminds us God fulfills our deepest longings and heals our deepest wounds. It's a prayer of strengthening our faith and commitment to God. It reassures us about where we stand and who stands with us. And it propels us forward in faithfulness and service, just as it did for those who first prayed it. So if you're a follower of Christ, may this prayer draw you deeper and deeper in love with God. And if you're not a Christian, may this prayer be for you the first step in seeking to put your trust in Christ. So I invite you to pray this prayer with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 